Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first closing uh, roundtable. I'm Sukanya Banerjee in the Department of English at the University of California, Berkeley. And on behalf of Lauren Goodlett, my fellow co-organizer, and uh, the um, Rutgers British Studies Center, I warmly invite everyone, for those of you who have been listening in the previous two sessions, thank you for staying on. For those of you who are tuning in, um, a very warm welcome. Uh, so uh, the idea behind the closing roundtable is we have a very distinguished uh, panel of speakers and um, you know, we look forward to uh, having them share their thoughts on the topic based on their current or past research or teaching. Um, the roundtable will also uh, give us an opportunity to reflect and synthesize ideas that have emerged over the course of the day. So we look forward to what we hope is going to be an engaging and vibrant conversation. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce uh, our panel of speakers. I will introduce everyone all at once and then get out of the way. Each of the speakers speaks for seven minutes and we will then move on to the Q&A. Please type in your questions in the Q&A and I will uh, read them out aloud, right? So our first speaker is Sander L. Gilman, who's a distinguished professor emeritus of the liberal arts and sciences, as well as emeritus professor of psychiatry at Emory University. A cultural and literary historian, he is the author or editor of over 100 books. His I Know Who Caused COVID-19, Pandemics and Xenophobia with Zhu Zhan appeared with Reaction Press in 2021. His most recent edited volume is the Oxford Handbook of Music and the Body with Yun Kim published in 2019. He is the author of Seeing the Insane, published by John Wiley and Sons in 80, 1982, as well as the standard study of Jewish self-hatred the title of his Johns Hopkins University Press monograph of 1986. A recipient of various honors and distinguished fellowships, he has been a visiting professor at numerous universities worldwide. He was president of the Modern Language Association in 1995 and made a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016. The next speaker is Ranjani Chatterjee, who is the author of Feminine Singularity, The Politics of Subjectivity in 19th Century Literature, which is forthcoming summer 2022 from Stanford UP. She's the co-editor of a special issue of Victorian Studies, Undisciplining Victorian Studies. She's also the editor of the Norton Critical Middle March, which is expected in 2023. Professor Chatterjee will be followed by Seth Coven, who is GE Lessing Distinguished Professor of History and Poetics at Rutgers. He's the author of Slumming, Social and Sexual Politics in Victorian London, Princeton 2004, and The Match Girl and the Heiress, Princeton 2014. He is completing a book project called Conscience Wars, Christianity and Coercion in Britain and its Empire. A part of that book, Brahmin Wives and Pedagogies of Conscience in Mid 19th Century British India is forthcoming in Modern Asian Studies. The next speaker is Luz Elena Ramirez, who is Professor of English at California State University, San Bernardino. Her most recent publication is the chapter entitled The Intelligibility of the Past in Bram Stoker's The Jewel of Seven Stars in Dobson's edited volume, Victorian Literary Culture and Ancient Egypt, which was published by Manchester University Press in 2020. Today's presentation draws on the interdisciplinary approach of her first book, British Representations of Latin America, which was published by University of Florida, and her forthcoming book, Conquest and Reclamation in the Transatlantic Imagination, the Amerindian Adventures of Henty, Haggard, and Griffith, which is in production with Rutledge. Our final speaker is Adrian S. Wisnicki, who is Associate Professor of English and Faculty Fellow of the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He is a founding developer of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, lead developer of One More Voice, 
and director of Livingston Online. He's also the author of Fieldwork of Empire, 1840 to 1900, Intercultural Dynamics in the Production of British Expeditionary Literature, published by Rutledge in 2019. And he's also authored various articles in Victorian, African, and postcolonial studies, as well as the digital humanities. I now invite Professor Gilman to um, start the roundtable. Thank you. I thank you all, and I thank all of the organizers. I took my um, call very literally because the question is the brackets, how Victorianists might talk about race. And I went back actually, and here I want to be a little bit programmatic to the notion that race is as we share and all of the papers have assumed a set of historical and discursive practices. Um, that are tethered to some type of fundamental difference among and to certain bodies. These practices, of course, are all ideologically driven, but I want to avoid making the claim, as some even today have made, that ideologies necessarily drive practices. Ideologies about innate racial differences both produce and more importantly, or equally importantly, are also produced, certainly in the long 19th century, by the authority of the disciplines, because that's what we're really talking about. We're not really putting ourselves in the place of the people we are talking about. We are using disciplinary discourses to create their worlds and the intersectionality of their worlds. So when we look at medical, behavioral, social, and humanistic sciences, and their role not only within the colonizing cultures, but also the colonized cultures, we have to understand that what we're talking about when we talk about race is race embedded in precisely what we do the disciplines. Now, ideology and practice then are coterminous, co-functioning, and relational. Now, I'm not talking about any type of stable, fixed, or essentialized categories of subjectivity. Some in contemporary race scholarship consider race as a matter of identity. That is not my focus. This very treatment of race as identity politics essentializes racial categories as political entities while simultaneously arguing for their social and cultural contingency. You can't have it both ways. So for me, right, race in the long 19th century is unstable. It's shaped by historical material and discursive forces which in terms of interpretive functions are embedded in disciplines. They're without therefore any real basis in human biology, anatomy, physiology, but is, race is ontologically real, ontologically real in the sense that the category has been and remains today a fundamental organizer of political, social, and economic opportunities, especially in our jobs as members of academic disciplines. Now, for me, the long 19th century focuses in, in, on one for today rather co controversial problem, because it is also the age of physiognomy across all of the disciplines the act of seeing, the importance of images, I would argue even more than text across the disciplines, something that has to do with material world changes, the ability to have photography, then to engrave, and then to have rotogravure, all the while the source of images, both within the disciplines and the public sphere, becoming cheaper and cheaper and more available and because we talk about our social media now as global, 
as global in the 19th century. The images that we are dealing with are, are ever problematic today, precisely because in the 19th century, in medicine, in the humanities, in art, in newspapers, their goal is emotive, is effective. Now, I, as some of you know, have taken a lot of hits for this over the last 45 years because I believe that working with images is a vital part of what we do. And it's a vital part of what we do because it is exactly, exactly the role of the emotive, the effective, that should be at the center of all scholarship dealing with race. In one of my recent books, a book called Stand Up Straight, which is a history of posture, I really look at these disciplines, at medicine, at anthropology, right? Um, at education, all of which become formalized in the long 19th century in what in Britain is called the, the Victorian age and throughout the world is oftentimes called the age of colonialism, right? Now I have a chapter which upset a lot of my readers on a discipline which was incredibly central and that is race science. It is dismissed of course today as pseudoscience but it is not pseudoscience in the 19th century. And it relies as much as any other field on visual sources. Now, in that chapter, I talk about race science dealing with, of course, Africans and African Americans, with slavery and Africans in the colonial setting. I talk about Jews and the racialization of Jews in the course of the 19th century, again, within anthropology, within sociology, within race science. But I begin that chapter with the Irish, because I wanna make an argument that when we talk about the instability of categories, we have to understand that intersectionality also has to do with the intersectionality of images right, of images, images that seem to be in one sphere, the English talking about the Irish becomes a way of the Germans talking about the Jews, same images, same discussions, the Americans talking about African Americans, both before um, emancipation and during Jim Crow, and by the way, well into the 20th century with discourses about eugenics. So I wanna sort of say that if there is a way that Victorians might, might talk now about race is one not to shy away from using and analyzing images and two, understanding that the disciplinary silos which each of us find ourselves in exists from the 19th century. And it's exactly the cross disciplinary questions that we uncover in the study of race in the 19th century that may be a sign for our own interdisciplinarity. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chatterjee. Great. Um, thank you, Shukonna and uh, Lauren, for organizing this symposium. And I want to thank the panelists from today, too, and um, my fellow roundtable participants for um, uh, a very engaging um, day and uh, hopefully a productive uh, conversation to follow. So, um, like Sander, I too took the sort of prompt for the roundtable um, quite literally. So I'm just going to offer um, some remarks that I prepared um, based on my thinking about the title of the symposium and then close with a couple of questions that um, occurred to me as I listened to the presentations today. So how Victorianists might talk about race. 
I take the title of this two-day symposium to suggest both a present and a tentative future for scholars gathering under the sign of Victorianist. It's something of a rogue proposition for a term that has been much derided and partially phased out as a field descriptor or organizational possibility for 19th century objects of study. What might it mean to renew it here? Renew the Victorian contrapuntally, as Said would say, or hate the Victorian properly, as Nasser Mufti has recently suggested. What, if anything, is Victorian about the study of modern race and racialization? And what is, what is racialized about the Victorian? Victorian shelters a double logic, affirmation and denial, intrusion and embrace, with which Englishness crystallized unevenly as whiteness through its mediation of other bodies, geographies, and resources. To talk about race then and now is to enter, as Sander mentioned, into unstable and contradictory territory, a kind of metalepsis that slides between different registers of being and telling. To further understand racialization is to think of it not only as a problem of language, what Stuart Hall refers to as the floating signifier of race, but also as a question of affect, how we feel, how much or how little we can feel, how does it feel to be a problem, and so on. Attempting then to talk about race yokes in both diverse and interlocking spatial and material histories, as well as questions of aesthetics, form, and representation. The notorious racist and Scottish anatomist Robert Knox proclaimed in 1850 that race is everything. Literature, science, art, in a word, civilization depend on it. In The Races of Man, Knox deployed an influential, detailed, virulent, and systematic treatise on racial hierarchies, paving the way for what we now know to be called scientific racism. Poised on the edge of monogenetic and polygenetic theories of racial difference, Knox's treatise was at the same time, um, one, supportive of a notion of democracy and a contempt for the aristocratic ruling classes, two, vaguely against British and European nationalism, imperial expansion, so he called the rule, ruling of India um, fraudulent and violent, um, and a supporter of revolutionary action, citing the revolution in Haiti as an example to enslaved Black people in the United States. We can trace the afterlife of Knox's polygenetics both in Victorian popular fiction and in the discourse of the American Confederacy. So one of the things that Knox's sort of treatise shows us is that examining the discourse of race in the 19th century yields not only a high degree of instability, but what might be read in the contemporary um, as an equally high degree of political incoherence. racialization along a more fixed political spectrum. And from one angle, Knox wasn't wrong. Race is everything, because racial capitalism born out of coloniality and the forced movements of black and brown people across the world is the ongoing reality of our lives, whether we like that or not. There is therefore no intellectual question that can be posed about the Victorians or about us that is race neutral. Out of this incoherence, then, comes not only a certain kind of amnesia about race, forms of erasure, literal and figure, figurative absence and forgetting, and euphemism, which, which distinguish both the archives and the literary and cultural objects we look to to untangle how the 19th century formulated a discourse of racial difference. But as Anne Stoller writes, something else happened too, um, what she calls a colonial aphasia writing particularly about the colonial histories of France, Stoller describes aphasia as, quote, what it means to know and not know something simultaneously, about what is implicit because it goes without saying, uh, or because it cannot be thought, or because it can be thought and is known but cannot be said. At issue for Stoller is the irretrievability of a vocabulary, a limited access to it, a simultaneous presence of a thing and its absence, a presence and the misrecognition of it. 
It's thus for Stoller not a matter of ignorance or absence um, that is talking about race, but quote, aphasia is a dismembering, a difficulty speaking, a difficulty generating a vocabulary that associates appropriate words and concepts with appropriate things. Given the rich body of scholarship on race that already exists in fields like Caribbean studies and post-colonial studies, in 18th century British studies, and from, from within Victorian studies too, especially in Black British studies, um, and some of which we've sort of heard of today, it strikes me that what Victorianist scholars need to grapple with isn't necessarily an amnesia around race, but just what Stoller points to, aphasia, a dismembering of what the term Victorian actually designates, not a certain kind of white innocence, but differently situated histories of labor, violence, migration, and enslavement. As a literary scholar, it interests me what role literature and aesthetics writ large play in negotiating these various asymmetries. Marxist critics of Victorian literature, and most notably the Victorian novel, have pointed to the precise techniques that literature develops to mediate the rise of industrial capitalism and grapple with its, um, with its scale. Can we formulate those precise vocabularies for the formalization of racial difference too? So today's presentations renew the generative tension between historical specificity and a claim made by Paul Gilroy, that analyzing race, racisms, and racialization always carries, quote, with it, the onerous abiding obligation to specify how a world unshackled from the cruel constraints of racial hierarchy might actually differ from the present tainted arrangements. Our collective thinking could hopefully be put to use in, in illuminating the imaginative contours of what the archives cannot or will not show. Um, so on this note, I just want to close with a few questions that occurred to me as I was listening to the talks um, today. Um, so the first one is about narratives of liberal progress and, and freedom. Um, how are those narratives, how have those narratives structured the, our very methods of studying history and the historical past? And how might, we, how might we counter them, especially from work outside the Eurocentric frame? So here I'm thinking a bit about Dr. Chakraborty's and Dr. Lumba's papers. Um, and in light of ongoing discussions about the law, um, about the body, about medical discourse and jurisprudence, how might Victorianists productively engage theories of fugitivity, um, mobility and movement from Black studies? Um, so here, I'm thinking of everybody from Sadia Hartman to um, Yogada Goyal's um, work. And, and how, in turn, can the work of historians um, and literary scholars in British studies lay further groundwork for those fields, too? Um, and finally, um, you know, thinking about these histories of racial capitalism um, and narratives of racial capitalism um, seem to me across many of these disciplines to turn around, um, uh, you know, the problem of the case or the case study. And, and that is um, you know, in my view, an interesting question of genre. So how might we sort of think about the genres of, um, you know, um, uh, assessing um, and thinking about racial difference um, that sort of seem to be um, reoccurring across uh, disciplinary divides. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you so much, Professor Chatterjee. Professor Govan. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you for this opportunity to engage with these fantastic papers. Um, I'd like to begin my remarks by shifting from how we might talk about race to when and why we must. And I'll do so by sharing a fragment of a very unwieldy long chapter that has a lot of Ryder Haggard's anthropology, political work and novels in it to, uh, that's entitled Born White race and the conscientious objector to vaccination. Here's my historical argument up front. Parliament enacted a quiet but profound world revolutionary moment in the House of Lords in August of 1898, when the noble peers finally gave in 
and allowed Section 2 of the Vaccination Act to be included. That section allowed parents to conscientiously object to their children's compulsory vaccination. The conscientious objector was a legal outlaw, a person whose violation of law was sanctioned by law. COs loom large as great souls. They fill the ranks of those political prisoners that Sarah's work often engages with. They're heroes, and in any number of ways, they try to resist overmighty power. But what my work shows is the sordid genealogy of this much vaunted category. I show the ways in which that person was born white and Christian, and that the birth of this category and this person was presided over by explicitly anti-Brown and anti-Black racism, which excluded non-white people from making claims to conscience. Now, one reason Victorianists haven't in fact discussed this is that the archive is so dominated by questions around gender and class. I went down a fabulous rabbit hole following the Swedenborgian feminist, poet, novelist, and leader of the anti-vax movement, Mary Catherine Hume Rothery, for several years. But all of that changed when I read the testimony before the parliament in Australia of John Stuart Helps, an otherwise insignificant um, white supremacist sugar planter from Natal in South Africa, who made the remarkable proclamation that he didn't think the men who run South Africa, I think the men who run South Africa do not believe that a Zulu person has such a thing as a conscience. This prompted me to go back and reread the archives, both metropolitan and parliamentary, of the anti-vax movement, as well as to transform the temporal and geographic space in which I looked at the Victorian problem of anti-vax and conscience. It took me to the House of Lords, where I discovered, in fact, that on that fateful day, race, nation were elided and deeply at the center of the debate. Anti-anti-vaccinator lords contended that to create the conscientious objector in Britain was to open up the floodgates of anti-colonial nationalism in all kinds, particularly in India, where real conscientious objectors might mobilize against the fact that they were denied this category while whites and Europeans were given it. The Indian um, intellectuals in the Kolkata newspaper, Amrita Bazar Patrika, put the matter bluntly. If the conscience of the minority is respected in England, why should not the same be done in India? But the conservative prime minister, Lord Salisbury, had a ready reply a reply that I did characterize as the cunning of whiteness, punning on the cunning of capital and the cunning of reason. And which is he laid bare the racist nationalism at the heart of empire and his party's approach to it. He said that telling him what was going on in Ceylon and in India and in other parts of the empire was irrelevant. He said, the reason why we're giving conscience here in England is because they are Englishmen. It is no use to quote me the precedents of India and Ceylon. Englishmen have consciousness to be protected, Indians do not. Now, the story then took me to Natal. And here, while I won't have time to do it, Natal is a preeminent site of markets of dispossession and settler and extractive colonial, colonialism, as Alan's paper showed us. And here's a visual record of a humanitarian narrative about the essentialness of vaccinating Africans in order to protect the ability to extract their labor, but doing it in the name of helping them. Um, but this is countermanded by the absolute terror and violence that we find in the archive of vaccination. Here, I'll just quote from one little piece of it from Henry Havelock Sturge, where he describes the quarantining of the healthy and the sick inside an African village. I have no single note of any unvaccinated person enclosed in the quarantine line escaping the disease whereas those who are vaccinated do. But he describes a scene of terror, a terror in which helpless victims during the night remain in fear lest they should see their huts in flames. Neighbors endeavored to burn out the pestilence by thrusting a lighted brand into the thatch. This cruelty he is forced to address when he gives testimony in the, before the vaccination commission. Now, all of these things came together when the race of conscience was debated in Natal's legislative assembly. And when Mr. Armstrong, himself a white supremacist, asked if the conscience clause is going to be extended to the natives and the Indians. 
we get the most powerful and audacious answer from McClarty, who was a white supremacist, Scotland-born emigre from Australian. And he says, it would not be wise to have a conscience clause for the natives and Indians to raise obstacles in connection with vaccination. What we have got to do today is to consider the consciences of Europeans in this country and no other. In Natal, the imperative to control Africans' labor guided vaccination policies and made their freedom of conscience irrelevant. Anti-Black and anti-Brown racism presided over the birth of the anti-vaccinator CO as a legal person and as a white Christian. It shaped the long-term legacies about who, who did and did not have the right to claim conscience-based protections from compulsory vaccination. How then might Victorianists talk about race? One, we might refuse the cunning of whiteness acting under the rhetorical sign of Englishness, so deftly mobilized by Lord Salisbury, and its obfuscation of race through the language of Englishness and nation. We might begin to look for, not so much contrapuntally a la Said, but rather by expanding the temporal boundaries and geopolitical boundaries of the Victorian, we might expand our archive, which would then have us go back to the original Metropolitan Archive and discover that in plain sight, race really did matter during the anti-vaccination and conscience debates. And finally, we might relocate where we tell stories about Victorian culture so that race will emerge in its full centrality, as I hope in my very brief remarks today, it has. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Coven. And I will try to stop sharing as soon as I <laughs> figure okay. out how to do that. Uh, okay. Professor Ramirez. <laughs> You want to un uh, unmute yourself, the the mic, unmute the mic. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> can everybody see my screen? Okay, so the title of my very brief presentation is Victorian Representations of Race in the Amerindian Adventure. Um, Professor Coven, you've just given me a, um, a sort of sad transition to the conquest and smallpox. <laughs> um, that won't be the, uh, the focus, but it's definitely relevant. So the overview, um, I'd like to locate this project within my book, Conquest and Reclamation in the Transatlantic Imagination, The Amerindian Adventures of G.A. Henty, Ryder Haggard, and George Griffith. I'd also like to address the sources and inspirations for Victorian representations of race. I'm focusing on Mexico. I'd like to engage with Norman Etherington's assessment of the character Thomas Wingfield and his multicultural identity in Haggard's novel, Montezuma's Daughter, which takes place during the Spanish conquest. And I'm going to focus on two illustrations in Haggard's Montezuma's Daughter um, that depict Wingfield as what I call a cultural mediator, somebody who is um, caught between and yet moves um, between English, Spanish, and Amerindian cultures. So one of the things I think is important are the sources um, and the inspirations for Victorian representations of race. Of course, we've got a series or a, a tradition of transatlantic um, writings. This includes Dryden's play, Indian Emperor, um, a, not a well-known writer, but a, an early uh, 18, or 19th century writer, um, St. John Dorset and Montezuma, A Tragedy in Five Acts. We've got G.A. Henty's uh, novel, By Right of Conquest, and then, of course, we've got illustrations of the Amerindian adventure um, in periodicals like uh, the graphic. In addition, we have codices, um, a collection of codices uh, compiled by Kingsborough, Antiquities of Mexico, 
The British Museum, of course, was a source um, for writers and it includes um, Mexican codices and masks. That collection is still there, you can go see it. And it was there in the, um, in the 1800s as well. The probably the most important history would be Prescott's history of the conquest of Mexico. We've also got travel logs um, and we've got lithographs, one of which is pictured here on the left, uh, Catherwood's views of ancient monuments in Central America, Chiapas and the Yucatan. And of course, in the 1800s, um, especially after uh, independence, travelers could actually visit Mexico and Haggard went there in 1891. So the focus of this talk is about um, Montezuma's daughter and the protagonist and narrator, Thomas Wingfield. Etherington contends that an Englishman of Spanish blood was an unusual combination for a Haggard hero, that it would be unthinkable for Haggard, whose previous romances emphasized the identification with the savage peoples, to side with the Spanish, particularly the famous conquistador Hernan Cortez, and the soldier historian Bernal Diaz. On the other hand, he had never attempted to view resistance to European conquest directly through the eyes of the conquered. And um, I've focused again on two different illustrations. This first one is in the graphic. Uh, the caption reads, all that I could see was the gleam of armor in the mud. I threw myself upon it, gripping at the wearer's throat, and together we roll down the tide of the causeway in the shallow water at the edge of the lake. Now, when we're looking at this image, we see the conquistador who's thrust against that causeway, trying to push back um, what looks like an Amerindian, a Mexican, with a plumed headdress and a tunic. This is Thomas Wingfield. <laughs> um, this is one of the moments where Thomas Wingfield has um, taken the side of the Mexicans against the Spanish, and he is very much, um, uh, you know, fighting on their behalf. And he is wearing their garb. He's a he's a brother in arms um, to Guatemoc, who's a historically real Aztec uh, prince. And so I just think that this kind of image um, really upsets a lot of expectations about. Um, race in the Victorian period, and um, again shows a kind of fluidity in, um, in identity. So I'd like to extend Etherington's analysis to argue that Wingfield's Andalusian roots, and this is uh, evident in the description of his um, skin, hair, and his eye color, along with his mother's birth in Sevilla, it allows him to pass for an Aztec warrior in yet another illustration, this one by Maurice Griffinhagen. This illustration is in the Longman's 1893 edition and the caption is entitled, At Length de, de Garcia, I Cried in Spanish. So Wingfield is able to speak Spanish. He's picked it up from his mother. Of course, he speaks English. Um, he also falls in love with a, an Aztec and Otomi princess. So he picks up Nahuatl and he meets the historically real um, interpreter Malinche. Um, and what we see again is him in this warrior garb as he's attacking who he thinks is his nemesis, but really is Bernal Diaz. So uh, in wrapping up, um, trying to keep to my time, lit, time limit, the questions for interpretation of race in the Victorian Amerindian adventure, adventure um, is this a cultural appropriation? Is there an authentic uh, attempt to understand or even become the other? Um, that's a topic that Bradley Dean uh, explores. Um, or is literary reckoning with how cultural identity is already complex and hybrid? Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor Wisniki. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to begin by thanking Shukanya, Lauren, and Belinda for organizing this symposium, uh, the Rutgers British Studies Center and Berkeley Center for British Studies for sponsoring it, and the other members of this roundtable for joining me. Uh, also to our audience members, if you've hung on this long, thank you as well for staying on. Uh, over the last few days, I've, I've reflected on the ways I might approach my talk. 
I considered centering it on my own identity as a white scholar who works on issues of interracial, or to use the term I favor, intercultural relations in Victorian studies. I also considered taking the symposium's title less as an indication, the way in which Victorianists might talk about race, and more as a question, how might they do it? Amidst these reflections, however, I found myself asking not only how, but also why. Why should we do it? One answer is because we, the field of Victorian studies, have waited too long, and it's costly not to wait any longer because our field will become irrelevant and because it's a matter of disciplinary conscience. In the wake of 2020, how can we say our scholarship is founded on solid ethical grounds if we are not foregrounding issues of race? These answers might be a good start for the why, but they're rest, less relevant for me because I followed a different intellectual journey and have been writing about issues of race in Victorian literature for the last 15 years. So recent events, and scholarship have not compelled me to center race since I was already doing that, but instead to enter into a kind of permanent state of intense self-critique of how I was doing it and how I could do it better. In the last decade and a half, I've been involved in four significant projects. Fieldwork of Empire, a monograph that seeks to examine the impact of non-Western cultures on Victorian exploration literature related to Africa. Livingston Online, which for me has always been a way of foregrounding the African cultural contexts in which abolitionist David Livingston traveled and worked. One More Voice, which focuses on recovering the contributions of authors and other creators of color from 19th century British and Imperial, Colon British and, British Imperial and Colonial Archives. And Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom, which centers race in what we've come to understand through the project is research by another name, teaching. There's no denying that I am a white European scholar who spent the majority of his career engaging with and writing about the histories of various eth African ethnic groups as documented in British archival literature. It's also worth noting that when I started on this trajectory, it wasn't the best career move because of the inherent racism in Victorian studies that I witnessed firsthand in job interviews, conference presentations, and elsewhere when the topic of my research came up. So although the origin of my interest in combining Victorian and African studies reflects a unique year-long chance to live in Botswana in the early 2000s, an event that awakened in me a long-term interest in the history of colonialism in Africa, the reason why I persisted has a different source. It grew out of a desire to change the field of Victorian studies because the representations I encountered in historical Victorian literature and in contemporary Victorianist scholarship ran at odds with a more complex underlying reality that I'd encountered while living abroad. After a year in Botswana, I could no longer think of the people inhabiting the African continent in broad brush racial strokes. Where Victorianists referenced Africans in monolithic histories, I reflected on vast diversity among different ethnic groups, cultural boundaries that were fluid, layers of historical settlement that were complex, and ultimately intersectional identities that didn't map onto the undifferentiating racial terms cast onto them. So my way of engaging with race became a concerted effort to push back against its deleterious homogenizing dimensions. My why grew out of a desire to rethink and re-examine the archival record in a way that better reflected what was found in that record and in the African cultural realities documented by that record, however problematically. As a result, in the days leading up to this symposium, I've been giving thought to what through line I might use to describe my work. One word that came to mind is recovery, and that fits key aspects of my work while connecting it to the work of a scholar who's had a significant impact on me, Kim Gallen. In a 2016 essay, Gallen writes, quote, recovery rests at the heart of Black studies as a scholarly tradition that seeks to restore the humanity of Black people lost and stolen through systemic global racialization. It follows then that the project of recovering lost historical and literary texts should be foundational to the Black digital humanities. It is a deeply political enterprise that seeks not simply to transform literary canons and historiography, though it certainly does that. Black digital humanities troubles the very core of what we have come to know as the humanities, by recovering alternate constructions of humanity that have been historically excluded from the concept. So Gallen, even though she's coming from a different disciplinary perspective, 
It's helped me conceptualize the kind of intervention I've been interested in making in Victorian studies. However, I'm also slightly uneasy about using the word recovery as it sounds too much like recovering, i.e. recovering again. That's not what I want to be doing when, via one more voice, I engage with the histories and voices, the uh, histories, voices, and contributions of individuals of color in the archives, or via undisciplining the Victorian classroom, when I and my collaborators work to create a platform through which Victorianists from some of the Academy's most underserved populations have a chance to speak and be heard. In these cases, I and we are much more focused on uncovering, on removing, imp on removing impediments than moving out of the way as established scholars so that others less privileged might have a place at the table. In such cases, what we're doing also res resonates with an essay that Sophia Noble published in 2019, partly in response to Gallen, where Noble notes that by quote, foregrounding a paradigm of critical engagement and activist scholarship that privileges the concerns of those living in the greatest conditions of precarity because of a combination of economic, racial, and environmental violence, we can think about the implications of digital humanities work in larger global contexts. Noble is thinking in broad global terms, but in, but in some of my shared work, we've been exploring how to undertake similar work locally in the field of Victorian studies so that we might address some of the material inequalities created by the precarity in the academy. In terms of historical voices, I've also focused along related lines by redirecting the terms of encounter within archival texts so that authorship might be understood in more expansive, non-Eurocentric terms while foregrounding the significant issues in the process of creation and interpretation. So for me, this symposium has created an opportunity to consider not just how I engage with race in my Victorianist scholarship, but also to reflect on and articulate why I do it, since I am a white scholar. And for me, as for many other white scholars, sadly, race remains a choice we aren't necessarily compelled to make by virtue of our race. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a rich set of papers and um, you know, I have so many thoughts um, uh, coming in and, and, and I invite the audience to type in um, their uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, just to get the conversation started, um, I, I, I want to just sort of pause and kind of uh, pull out some of the key points that you know, sort of uh, uh, came out to me from, from your uh, presentation. So, uh, you know, uh, there's the emphasis on visuality, on images, right? And which we kind of saw beautifully play out in uh, Professor Ramirez's presentation, uh, you know, which uh, Professor Gilman uh, emphasized. Uh, there's an emphasis on place and location. This is Professor Cohen and Professor Wisnicki's uh, papers. Um, of course, conscience, affect, aphasia, right? Um, in stringing these together in thinking about sort of different sort of conduits into thinking about race, which is what, what you all are doing, I was wondering if we can suture this back to the previous two panels and the emphasis on systems of capital. In what way do you think these terms that have sort of emerged through our discussion here um, intersect with, resonate, or reiterate, or reify systems of capital that um, you know have provided one very important frame for thinking about race? So I open with that and just um, let's take it from there. Yeah, please go for it. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um... So my entire inquiry is framed by the two overriding imperatives that shape virtually every aspect of colonial policymaking, colonial anthropology and discipline formation, and the discipline of comparative world religions as it played out in Southern Africa. And that is to dispossess Africans of their land and to extract their labor. And the way to do that was through a system of proletarianization of that labor, Vaccination was one key facet of that process of the protection of labor. So the need to use chiefs as essential intermediaries and then create African vaccinators themselves was a crucial part of it. 
But another huge part of the story is that the debate about vaccination unfolded simultaneously with the Bambatha Rebellion, which was the single most important anti-colonial um, mobilization of resistance to in fact capital extraction and labor and labor demands in um, Natal. And so in my version of the story, those two events coincide in time and they're both governed by the logics of dispossession and extraction of labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prof Professor Ramirez, did you, um, who, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, thanks. Um, so to the idea of capital, one of the things that um, independence from Spain uh, accomplished is it opened Latin America up to investment, development, and tourism. And so uh, Mexico definitely was one of those places for investment. But I would argue that it wasn't just a, um, it wasn't a, a conventional or typical form of imperialism. It's what Kane and Hopkins call informal empire, um, soft forms of domination. And um, what the Amerindian adventure would do is in essence advertise the archeological wealth of places like Mexico and Peru, but also um, you know, uh, destinations for tourism. Um, and um, the writers that I'm dealing with had access to these um, systems of investment. Uh, for example, G.A. Henty, you know, who's a very popular Victorian um, uh, adolescent, young, young adult fiction writer. Um, his father was a stockbroker and he was definitely familiar with mining all over the world. Um, and uh, Haggard, of course, you know, is in South Africa. So, you know, he's familiar um, with the, the web of empire, um, but they, they all were sort of straddling this world of investment and then this world again of exploration and tourism and collection. Right, right, right. Thank you, thank you. Professor Goodman? Now, um, let me put a fly in the ointment here. I think this notion that capital and it's kind of a crude notion as most of these things are, which is you have the exploiter and those who are exploited, it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the, certainly not in the 19th century. What is interesting to me always is who benefits, who has access. So the fact that you've got a whole set of Central European Jews who become Muslims and become representatives, for example, of the British crown, right, in Equatoria, um, when you have the Irish running, right, the Indian army as non-coms, not as officers always, but then one has to ask real questions. And then, of course, the assumption always is, and Professor Ramirez pointed at this, is that the so-called colonized are always uh, subalterns, cannot speak, are exploited, rather than the fact that there is a kind of, and I'll quote Du Bois, a kind of talented tenth that grows up in all of the colonies, um, some of which comes out of Anglican schools in the British colony. I'm thinking specifically, obviously, of India, right? Anglo Indians. Um, and so again, I get very anxious when this kind of crude, I mean, it isn't even good Marxism because it's kind of überbahn basis um, as one has with, with um, uh, the American Hegelians in the 1860s. Um, the reality of course is, and that's where the emphasis on black and brown as a definition of race is really problematic because who is black, who is brown? Are the Irish black? Well, as non-coms in India, they're very white, but they're therefore in a very different caste situation, right? Um, to use obviously not the Indian caste system, but rather 20th century sociology as a way of talking about their position. So I think one wants to be really careful about this. You start to look at Australia, right? And you start to say, how does, the question of race play out in Australia, whiteness is reinterpreted constantly from the beginning, right, of Australians' settlement, right, through to what last week, 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And you know, your point about the gradations of, of, of class and caste is well taken. And I think that, um, you know, came out um, in uh, Professor Chakraborty's paper in, in, in the second uh, uh, panel session today. I want to just go to the point of the proletarianization, the plural. The word is escaping me. The proletarianization of labor, and uh, and think about the ways in which how we can weave in and just in the general uh, discussion of uh, of the racialization um, of 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 bodies, um, how we can weave in the sort of the the concern of ecology or the ecological imperative. Because you know, if you think of the proletarianization. A lot of that is happening in India, for instance, with uh, you know the forced growing of cash crops, which then you know leads to white scale famine. You know the deindustrialization, so to speak, of you know the cotton weavers and loomers. So there is a way in which the ecological strain is something that we want to keep in mind as well. And I wonder if the panelists have um, you know um, um, an input um, or, or connections that you might want to make in that regard. Well, the, the one thing I'd kind of raise as a point of consideration is when we're thinking about any given location um, for the kind of effects of capitalism, one thing we might think about is what happens to how we understand that process when we flip around the perspective and think about how uh, individuals in any given location in relation to the environments in which they're living uh, interpret adapt, resist, reuse, re rewrite, you know, think, think of your term, um, what happens through this kind of colonial process and how that um, transformation is a kind of appropriation and is a form of resistance. So, you know, I'd, I'd almost pose that as a kind of question. And I think that that would really vary um, by location, right? Because, you know, the process really works differently in any given location because of who's involved, uh, what kind of resources are available, what kind of possibilities are available, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Professor Colvin, did you want to? And the Professor Chatterjee? Then so Professor Goodland. Thank you. Thank you for the prompt on the ecological. The, the two most detailed studies of the spread of smallpox in late Victorian and then early 20th century Natal both essentially track the movement through global capitalist networks. And in particular, the movement of people in and out of the Kimberley mines, mm -hmm. then into the interior. Now, one way to read that story is that smallpox is of course, following the circuits of global capital. They actually end up tracing it back to a case of smallpox in England that comes shipboard to South Africa and then goes into the mines and then into the interior. But a kind of way to read that story is that the environmental and ecological disaster of the mines, coupled with the transformation of large scale African controlled agricultural holdings into capitalist sugar production on coastal colonies become the epicenters of concern around smallpox movement and get figured as the danger that dark people pose to the bodies of, of Europeans. So the, contag the contagion, which is something um, I think that uh, Ryan Fong in one of his articles, I believe, talks about the kind of contagion of the body. Um, so I think that there's, one could reread that story through the lens of ecology, both the, the way that, that the capitalized extraction industry and capitalized agriculture both transform landscapes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chatterjee, did you? I'm okay for now, thanks. Okay, okay. Professor Goodlatte, Lauren. You need to unmute your mic again, yeah. I'm in a public place, so I hope you can hear me all right. Um, thank you so much for these wonderful uh, discussions. Participants, um, please do ask questions. I realize that the format is a little awkward, but just because there's a lot of people here doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. 
So I, I will say something, however, I, I generally do. Um, and that is that um, I really love the way most of you reflected in a very dialectical way about the question of uh, quote unquote Victorianists um, and how we do, might, should um, talk about race. Uh, which um, you've all brilliantly spoken about. And I completely agree as well that, um, that capitalism, um, which both racializes and in some ways anti-racializes when it's convenient for it to do so. You know, capitalism is a very sort of fluid structure, um, a system of power that is really about uh, getting as much productivity from people who have to sell their labor as they possibly can. And so race sometimes functions extremely well um, for that, but occasionally um, critique of race functions well. So I, I think capitalism is elusive and it's a tough question to answer outside of um, specific cases how the intersection actually operates. So I'm going to uh, just throw out something that I hope the audience will also help me to think through, which is that it seems to me that there are um, two ways that Victorianists are uh, doing some work in reflecting on their own um, teaching and research practice as thinkers of race. And one involves acknowledging racism in their archive and asking important questions about that. And the other involves um, thinking about the way that the field uh, and in particular its canon um, does not give as much voice as it could to um, people at the time who were people of color, but also in a way that uh, carries on um, and, and demonstrates the continuing legacies, the way that um, people of color are not uh, well represented in our scholars and researchers. So I'm, I, I asked the panel, to um, help me think through the intersection of this, because for me, what's always challenging is that um, Victorian studies and 19th century American studies have interesting ways that they speak to each other and inflect one another, but they're, they're also different in key ways. And so I find that the answer of how to include, who to include, what kind of reflections really work is, is a hard one for us. And that's my question. Thank you. Do panelists want to take that on? Whoever wants to go first? I can just, oh, um, oh, oh sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, I've just been reflecting a little bit on, on some of these thoughts about um, what it means to kind of um, make the term racial capitalism central to, um, you know, a kind of Victorian studies approach to race. And it, it sort of seems to me that, you know, what's very important about the term um, is not only that it allows us to kind of um, change the frame of metropole and so-called periphery that has been in operation for a very long time in, in thinking about um, the so-called colonial encounter. So, you know, the, the risk of that frame um, or the risk of sort of continuing to use that frame is, um, well, it's not only sort of Hist historically inaccurate, right? Um, it doesn't do justice to, you know, the kind of network and, and circuits of, of how people um, were um, forcibly moved around or, or how they moved around in the 19th century. Um, but it also, to me, um, tends to kind of shore up those affective 
questions that we always um, rub up against when we're talking about race, which is sort of like ideas about sympathy, about benevolence, um, you know, about the um, people's capacity to feel too much or too little, right? Um, these all have to do with sort of the vulnerability of bodies that we've been talking about today. Um, so, you know, I, I think that broadening the frame to think about um, a world in which, um, you know, the relationship between um, the East India companies, um, you know, uh, uh, continued entrenchment in India has to do with um, the discourse around abolition, um, because you know um, the, the replacement, for instance, of, of wage labor of Bengali peasants um, tends to kind of like come in to um, kind of help the cause for ending a dependence on Caribbean um, sugar, um, and and sort of thinking about how you know again these terms black and brown are not fixed, but they're precisely you know, a fixed and, and, and unfixed by those capitalist circuits, right? And so um, it remains sort of important for us, um, I think, as Victorianists who might take our literate objects to be sort of Anglophone or even just written in Britain to be kind of in those intimate contexts, right, with, with, um, with these places and to think about those contexts as multiple, right, and not simply like in these in these sort of dyads um, again of metropole and, and periphery. So so those are some kind of thoughts towards toward that question. There's a question uh, that's come in uh, from the audience. It's from an um, anonymous attendee. Uh, the question is: There was interesting ideas about periodization today, whether thinking about the 18th century versus 19th century Jamaica or the Enlightenment and its legacies, or thinking about afterlives of Victorian racial formations. Does talking about race require distinct forms of historicism? And again, I, whoever wants to, you know, take it first and, you know, add. Let me, let me say, if, if race is a free-floating signifier, which I think it is, then the answer is, of course, not. What it forces us to do is to think about how our methodologies are limited by our disciplines, right? Because to be brutal about it, every discipline is always defined first, not by the methodology, but by the object, right? The distinction, the classic distinction uh, in the early social sciences between, the, between sociology and anthropology with sociology dealt with here and anthropology dealt with there, right? Um, so, I mean, one has to be very careful about confusing, um, can we say, methodological discussions as separate from the objects themselves. And oftentimes, and I've said this over and over again, the objects create the methodology and the methodology perpetuates and creates, right? the objects. Um, the difficulty is to get out of the silo and to start to say, what is the object? What does race mean? What does race mean? So last year, a lovely book came out. I always love selling books, right? Um, which is a fascinating book because it's almost all about England. It has nothing to do with Irish, it has nothing to do with Jews, and it has nothing to do with Britain or the UK. It has to do with the English, right? So one wants to ask these questions about race in ways that undermine both the methodological specificity and the notion that the objects are only real in the world. And I'm not gonna use constructed because we've had that debate already, right? Uh, but uh, can we say existing in the way that we imagine the world through our disciplines? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Siegel. Did you, you have a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on this historical question. It, it, it's, there were, um, I think there are options between free floating and, 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 and bound. And I, I was really struck by uh, two, two points that I'd like to bring up for the panel and, and invite for the discussion. One, uh, Catherine Hall's uh, conversation uh, at, on, on her panel about the 
the way that, that, that a certain theorization about race emerged when the legal system did not allow certain racist activities to go on. That was a fascinating uh, moment, right? If you think about it, right? Uh, you know, the, the differences between uh, the archives that are available in the 18th century and the 19th century, this is, and it's not accidental, right? It's kind of a squeezing down of, of certain ideas of what's gonna be legally allowed provoking an, an, an efflorescence of racist thought of, you know, of, of, of you know, the specific text that she mentioned. So that's on one angle, the kind of hit, the relationship between capitalism and race, very concretely present there. Um, and then I, I just, I, I wanted to ask Alan, there was an image he showed us of uh, was Uncle, Uncle Sam tutoring everybody, if you remember this kind of grotesque racist cartoon. What was really striking about that is that almost every, uh, every group what was represented as a as a grotesque uh, racist African American cartoon, right? So it was a it was an in interesting late nineteenth, early twentieth century, I guess, uh, vision in which everybody uh, what was 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 reduced to these sort of categories. And that in, in between that, we, I, I, I was struck by uh, in, in uh, Luz and Lena Ramirez's talk, the, the idea that we, it seemed like a very Kipling Kipling esque sort of idea of expertise and nuance in knowing the the the, the others, right? And so, uh, as a way of managing for for imperial projects, so I, I think we can historicize. Um, I mean, we were forced to historicize by our, our material. Um, and finally, just in the, on the question of 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 um, the the um, on this question of, of the, the blackness of Irish and so on. I, I think the idea of, of all the various, uh, what we now call white peoples who were driven overseas by oppressive capitalist structures in the 19th century by enclosure and so on, and then became the agents of racist practices. I think um, that, that is worth uh, dwelling on and spending some time on. It doesn't throw away the question of, of the, the, the location of, of, of race in, in all these topics. So th this is just a kind of a throwing in more texture, I think, to this, to what, what I understood to be some of the, the logic of that question that just came up about historical uh, periodization and, and race. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Professor Ramirez. Yeah, yeah I, um, I wanna ask a question um, of the panelists and uh, to do so, I just wanna give a very brief summary of a, a very interesting uh, Amerindian adventure. It takes place in Peru. It's about an Inca, who enters a death sleep in the 1530s, awakens in the Victorian period, um, has decided that he's going to reclaim his empire from um, the Spanish. Um, and he enlists, of course, uh, a, an English soldier uh, to help him organize this, this coup. And um, this was written um, uh, in 1897. It's called The Romance of Golden Star. And I'm wondering if um, what this, this novel does is it actually anticipates Marxist Latin American thought, uh, specifically with Mariategui's the seven interpretive essays um, on Peru. Um, and it, it imagines redistributing the wealth that the Spanish colonial um, machinery have appropriated. Um, it also revives uh, ancient bloodlines. And of course it um, features a mixed race, um, two mixed race uh, marriages to envision a new Peru. Um, and so I was wondering if we see any of that kind of um, literary Victorian imagination in other fields, in other geographies. So that's sort of a, a question for everyone else. Does the question have resonances? I mean, from your the specific contexts that you are working from. Lucilinda, would you mind just elaborating on your question a little bit? Yeah, I guess what I'm asking is um, this Victorian um, writer, Griffith, he, he's sort of anticipating a lot of 20th century um, cultural critiques in um, destabilizing, you know, these structures of power. He's not against, uh, he's, he's definitely for, you know, the distribution of wealth, um, but he also wants to keep the ancient, you know, lineage and in, 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 um, he wants to make sure that's secure. 
And I'm just wondering, is this sort of unique to George Griffith's um, imagination? Or were there similar kinds of, um, I call it reclamation. Reclamation is this process of restoring ancient lineage, redistributing wealth that's been taken by colonial power, reviving stirring symbols, um, telling stories that have been silenced. I was wondering, um, I'm studying you know, this author, but I was wondering, does this, does this phenomenon take place in any other um, geographies like South Africa, the Caribbean, India? Are we seeing any of these like narratives of reclamation in the Victorian period? The, the one thing that immediately occurs to me is that strikes me as a kind of a romanticization of indigenous people is George Barrow and the Gypsy Lore Society. Isn't that exactly what Barrow wants? He wants to reconstitute the notion of the Romani, right? As having a kind of special position within human society and has been, you know, ground down. And, and you know, and this becomes, I mean, again, this is completely romanticized with Barrow. It strikes me that it's completely romanticized in the text that you're talking about too. And Barrow is 1840s, for God's sake. I mean, you know, it doesn't take, you don't have to go to, to you know, H.G. Wells in the early 20th century to find this. I mean, you know. I... Yeah. I'll, I'll give you, uh, I would offer two examples. So the explosion in pharonicism, the view that the fellaheen in particular, the female peasant of Upper Egypt had in her body bearing the lineage of the ancient Egyptian pharaonic legacies and the hyper-regulation of it, the production of huge amounts of welfare that problematized her sorcery and magic and non-Western colonial knowledges on the one hand, but made her preservation crucial both symbolically and literally for the forging of an independent Egypt. So that would be one example. And then one closer to our shared um, obsession, Luz, with Ryder Haggard, is that Ryder Haggard also engages in a pretty deep romantic orientalist fantasy about what he perceived to be the character of Zulu people before their immersion either with missionaries or their entanglement with white and white ownership over their properties. And there he, he described Shaka as the single most extraordinary kind of ruler in modern history. He links Shaka, the um, early leader of the Zulu kingdom um, to the greatest figures of Western history while also saying that he produced what he calls a, an, a Saturnalia and orgy of violence. And so for Haggard, there is both a hypervaluing of a kind of pre-contact, pre-lapsarian Zuluness, which nonetheless allows and justifies a particular version of paternalist colonial governance through Haggard's alliance with Shepstone, who was his boss and the architect of the, of the most paternalist system in Southern Africa about how to govern Africans. So but those in, are two examples. So for the Zulu, if I may just follow up, because I'm really interested in this, um, for his representation, and it's been so long since you know I've, I've read those texts, but um, for his representation of Zulu culture or or the ideology that you're talking about, does that um, does that get echoed in any way, or does it get validated in any way, or is it always sort of uh, dismissed as you know still paternalistic, still imperial? In other words, um, to go back. Um, to Professor Gilman's point that these, you know, these binaries, these oppositions that are so firmly um, staked that they don't allow us, you know, to see these, so that the, the more fluid areas. Um, so I guess what's the cultural work uh, of Haggard in, in that context? Does is there any cultural work? Because when I'm what I'm seeing is that, um, uh, for example, both Haggard and Griffith they elevate Malinchi way before the civil rights movement, you know, 70 years before she was recuperated. Um, and so you know, that's a very kind of a charged thing to say, but it's true, it's, it's, it's in their novels. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a similar thing um, that's going on with Haggard and Zulu. Yeah, 
I'll, I'll answer it in two ways, drawing on Catherine Hall's paper and on Sarah Winter's paper, if I might, to try to connect them. So uh, the founding story of British colonialism in Natal is Dingon's massacre of the Fort Trekkers in 1838. And every single history needs to tell it. And just as Catherine Hall was suggesting that the consolidation of a historical narrative about Jamaica did political work in the face of abolitionism, so too the need to the, the iterative obsession with the telling of that story to which Haggard devoted two full length novels in which he re-narrates that story. Um, Nada the Lily, which has only African characters in it and then Marie. Um, but so he's obsessed with telling that story and the consolidation of that history really works to produce an idea to draw on another paper that we had today on um, the terror of the black subject, which becomes the alibi for colonial terrorism against subjected black people. You tell that story in order to sanction colonial violence because these people are always going to engage in massacres. On the other hand, Haggard also attempts to recuperate aspects of this Zulu culture. And he does it in conversation with James Stewart. And here I'm thinking of the also Sarah's paper around indigeneity, because James Stewart collected 25 years of oral testimonies spoken by in, to him in Zulu and in different Bantu languages um, in order to record how Africans said their history. And Haggard and Stewart were close correspondents. And Haggard, in fact, met him in 1914, and they had engaged in a kind of lifelong colloquy around trying to understand the mind of South Africans. And there, I'm sure Professor Winters would do amazing work on that archive around questions of indigeneity and law. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think there is um, a comment from um, uh, Ryan Fong that, um, you know, adds to this point. Uh, Ryan uh, talks about how there's one complex example to think through regarding Haggard is to consider his relationship with John Langila Bale Dube and Dube's refraction of Neda the Lily in the Zulu language novel, Inshallah Kashaka. Dube also provides the foreword to the Zulu translation of Neda the Lily. Dubey would become the first president of what would become the African National Congress. So it's a brilliant, brilliant. I mean, an even more beautiful answer, I guess, for you, Luz, about the, the way in which various actors can actually both build on a project that Haggard initiates, but also recuperate it and transform it. Um, although Dubé's own subject position vis-a-vis -vis the politics of that region um, is also complicated as everything is related to the ANC's history. Right, right. Um, I'd invite the audience to, you know, bring in questions. Um, I want to just uh, go to uh, a point that, um, Professor Visniki uh, made earlier on in his presentation in thinking of, you know, you made the comment about how during your um, stay in Botswana, in some way you were sort of, you know, uh, struck by the disjunction between the undifferentiated, you know, racial terms or, you know, sort of the undifferentiated nature of academic discourse in terms of talking about race and um, the way in which races lived or not in, in Botswana. So, so, you know, so, so the question of location becomes important, but there's also a disjunction that you're talking about in terms of this location. And I'm wondering if you can say a little more about that. Sure, sure, I'm happy to do so. And I, and I should say, so I've been, I've been listening very carefully to what people have been saying. And uh, in, in the context of your question too, one thing that really strikes me as interesting is the way that in thinking about uh, kind of this overall situation in the 19th century and in race, how, you know, with some exceptions, we really continue to rely on the British perspective. So, you know, we've obviously been talking about Haggard a lot and there are various kinds of moves to 
a recuperator writer like this, reinterpreter writer like this, uh, place him in conversation with other people. And so, you know, I've also been thinking, you know, what are some kind of alternatives, you know, especially kind of from my work that I could draw on to kind of think of alternative ways of thinking of this. And one thing that strikes me is that in a lot of the narratives that I'm thinking of that somehow kind of center uh, voices from people who aren't British, right, however we kind of define that, the kind of space for kind of future imagining can often be very limited, uh, can be very mediated. And so a lot of the kind of narrative that I come across, especially through a project like One More Voice, is much more pragmatically oriented towards speaking to specific historical circumstances um, and responding to those. And so I wonder if a kind of recognition of that fact that there's a kind of um, imaginative claustrophobia, claustrophobia, you could say, uh, within the texts that survive representing other perspectives, especially if we kind of move beyond fiction to nonfiction if that somehow kind of constrains what we can kind of say about these other perspectives or not, uh, and how at least trying to kind of grapple with these other perspectives might shift how we kind of think about this whole idea of discourse in this period. Uh, in terms of uh, just your question, uh, what I was getting at is that, um, you know, in, in my experience in Botswana, and, and I should say, you know, it, it the answer for this kind of question at least kind of, again, in my experience traveling in various places in Africa, we really vary by the location. Um, how race is understood, um, how individual relationships are understood, how cultural relationships are understood, uh, how relationships across cultures are understood, really kind of varies by the situation, by who's speaking, by who's speaking to whom. And it becomes very difficult to characterize situations. So for example, when one person is speaking to say somebody who's somehow closely related, right? And this could be kind of uh, ethnically related, uh, culturally related, they might characterize and think of themselves in one way. Whereas they, when they're speaking to someone who's kind of outside of that group, they might characterize themselves in a different way uh, that might look like it's more in solidarity with the, the other people who they were kind of Inter is speaking with, but that when that's kind of flipped, there's a kind of differentiation. And so, yeah, it's a kind of very kind of complex process of identity that I'm trying to describe. But so one thing that that made me aware of is a kind of need to think very much to the particular situation and to the idea of kind of engaging with the particulars of a situation uh, with the issue being that when kind of shift, when shifted to other paradigms for thinking about this, especially kind of Western centered paradigms, they could feel very vague. And especially when one kind of talked about the issues of race, like past a certain point, they weren't very productive and didn't really reveal much. And so kind of the way my scholarship went was kind of trying to engage with these kind of complex relationships, you know, which I mentioned in my paper were in some ways intersectional, um, which were very fluid, uh, which involved various kinds of layers of kind of how people have settled in regions, the kind of histories that had developed in those regions among those people. And so that made for kind of thinking about issues in a, a related to race in the Victorian era, uh, much more complex than what I was encountering. And so a lot of my scholarship kind of grew out of that. But um, once I kind of started engaging with those histories or, or with those kinds of questions, the kind of scholarship I was doing really shifted from kind of discourse to history to, and especially to kind of material history because I found that that's where those questions were really being engaged. So uh, it's kind of a, a longer answer that I meant to give, but I don't know if that's helpful. No, no, that, that is very helpful. And I was wondering about the extent to which you, know, you talked about those constraints and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, you know, and I want to bring in um, Ranjani um, Chatterjee's kind of emphasis on the idea of aphasia. You talked about aphasia, and I'm wondering if those constraints, to what extent those constraints affect or produce the aphasia that you're talking about. Um, is that is that something you want to build on a little bit, um, Professor Chatterjee? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, scholars in Black feminist theory have been very good about trying to theorize sort of all the um, 
voices and histories that persistently get occluded from the archive, especially when we're um, sort of trying to um, sort of understand um, histories, material histories of enslavement, um, but also about colonialism itself. Um, as we know, colonial administrators destroyed um, many archives and, and sort of much paperwork too. Um, so we're working not only with a wealth of material that's written you know, from the perspective of, of the colonizer, from the perspective of um, white Britons, but also, um, you know, the kind of like forced um, uh, it, limitations of, of other on other voices. Um, so I think, you know, I, I try to think about the, the analytic tools that other scholars have provided. I mean, I, I continue to think that post-colonial studies interest in reading gaps and silences remains important, um, but that also the way that Black feminist theory has sort of um, taken up, um, you know, those absences in the archives um, through sort of other kind of imaginative reconstructions or um, through reading, um, you know, visual culture, right? What remains um, in those archives, those traces. Um, in other words, sort of bringing different analytical and critical tools to bear on that project of reclamation that Adrian was talking about, because I think. One of the, the the things that I try to avoid is, um, you know, kind of using or assuming the same grounds of agency, will, um, the bounded subject, freedom to kind of, um, you know, kind of do that work of reclamation or adding more voices to a syllabus or what have you, um, you know, it, it's not an accumulative process looking at those different archives or reading those gaps or, or trying to assemble, um, uh, you know, kind of those material histories from other perspectives also just requires that you change the theoretical frame through which you assess those voices too, right? So I think, um, you know, that's part of the aphasia amnesia problem, right? It's not merely that there's a forgetting and then there's a reinstitution of um, the evidence and, and the voices, but that in fact, there has to be like a real shift in how we approach what's there, what's not there, and then how we've also talked about what's there and what's not there. So, you know, I think that that, um, it remains a, a historical archival and material question for scholars, but I think it does remain a theoretical one too, right? So how do we really, change the terms of our, um, you know, engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor yeah. Colvin, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, I loved what Ronjani had to offer us around aphasia, and I'd like to just make a plug for what I think is a stunning piece of scholarship that takes African religious traditions and practices from a Southern African perspective and puts it in, into conversation with the discipline of comparative religion and that's David Chidester's Savage Systems. And the entire book is structured around aphasia, which is explicit and intentional around the forgetting that Africans have religion and the remembering that Africans only have religion after they have been conquered, exploited, and in various ways subjugated. But that the conditions that make possible their subjugation requires a kind of a collective aphasia about what was already known. And he charts this in conversation with a deep knowledge of African religious spiritual traditions through a colonial archive over around four centuries. It's pretty astonishing work. And I think um, it so much builds on your points, Professor Chatterjee. 